Vim, The Tale of Immortality, by Dysylvania. Episode 1. Broken, but not forgotten. Oh, a new curious mind. Welcome, 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 my dear one. I am the Book of Recollections. And, as you might have already guessed, I'm not your usual paperback. You can hear me, can you? <laughs> yes, you can. I am not one of the voices in your head. <laughs> Don't be surprised. I am, of course, magical. Now, lend me your ears and let me tell you a story of might and magic, treachery and thievery, boldness and bravery, a story still unfolding page after page as it has not yet reached its end. I am writing it as it happens, and I tell a tale of truth, nothing more and nothing less. I am an honest book, <laughs> but enough about me. I am sure you are eager to dive into the story. So let me set the stage. Darkness, heavy breathing, ache. Lucius stood on the battlefield, eyes closed, but even so, he could see the bodies Bits and pieces, guts spilt, arms ripped off, throats sliced, and blood. So much sticky blood and death everywhere. He gasped for air as his lungs filled with his own blood, and the harsh truth settled in. He was dying. He was only twelve, and his small frame was one of the many that were butchered by the ravagers. They would eventually call it the Hillside Village's Massacre. Lucius witnessed the fall of those fledgling human communities and his own. The air was heavy with despair as the stank of death drew nearer and nearer. However, destiny had a different plan for Lucius that day. The dice rolled, deciding his fate. He faltered on death's door in a desperate struggle for life. Thrice, he almost burst in through that door. But still, something kept him on the side of the living. Something burning deep in him wouldn't let him die. Not yet, at least. The cosmos shifted, blurring Lucius' fading consciousness as he transcended time and space, witnessing the making of the world. Vim, the essence of creation, birth Obscuro and Lumino the gods of matter and spirit, who began shaping the world. Lumeno ignited five stars of pure spirit, and the sixth bright and blazing as strong as the sun. Thus, Solace was born. Obscuro sculpted the pinnacle of matter, the graceful moon, Lunai. Then, in the hearts of the gods, greed unfolded, each desiring to spawn children of their own. So, the nocturnals, beings of strong matter, and the urnals of pure spirit emerged and came to be, unleashing a divine competition for supreme creation and immortality. They neared perfection when they brought to life the illuminated orcs and pitted them against the long-lived elves on a battlefield where devotion and survival of the fittest reigned supreme. Unclaimed by any of the gods, somehow, Humans emerged, always hunted, always oppressed, their prayers always unanswered. As the sky seemed to collapse, a red dot screamed at Lucius in a strange language, and the sound of it pulled him back to his senses, back into his body, back to the bloody battlefield. Lucius opened his eyes in pain. Both his legs were broken, but he was alive. He survived, one of the few who witnessed not just the butchering, but also the aftermath of blood and bodies, revealing the fragility of humans in a broken world. Lucius gazed over the dead, and something shifted within him. Not much, but enough to rewrite his destiny. A flash of light emanated from outside his body, from another room, another time, not from Lucius's dream. Twenty years later, the Hillside Village's massacre is a searing memory that still haunts Lucius as he wakes up 
from his recurring nightmare, impossible to escape. Poor Lucius! <laughs> but we are only starting. The story moves us along to Greenwell, a desolate settlement where survivors cling to their lives. Here is Hebdom's home, an old sage, a devotee of Martha's, holding the power to reveal truths by reading the stars. He shares his modest life with Halria, his daughter, and Elizabeth, his wrinkled, bitter wife, with only one arm and endlessly complaining. <laughs> I'll spare you her snide remarks. Well, recently, Lucius became a guest in their home. It was a new experience, since he lived alone in the woods, primarily surviving on delicious tree bark. That may be why he was very skinny and his ribcage was visible. It might have been destiny, <laughs> or not that brought Lucius to Greenwell, for here also lived Gregory, a mountain of a man, with a hammer that spoke volumes, serving as the unofficial leader. Gregory embodied the community spirit, inspiring people to keep building. Everyone sincerely appreciated his guidance, especially his siblings, Patrick and Alla, as they were being prepared to take over the reins. In this forsaken settlement, 25 to 30 souls endured as their existence unfolded in humble dwellings. They were often caught in a constant battle with hunger, sustained by turnip soup, bone broth, carrots, and the occasional daily egg. In this crucible of struggle and poverty, Gregory, Lucius, and Hebdom found themselves uprooted by unsettling astral prophecies foretelling the salvation of humanity by bringing death to the world as they knew it. They embarked on a quest to find the magic that could change the world, guided by the elusive constellations. The Tome, the Builder, the King, the Betrayer, the Hunter, and the two ravens towards something called the Tomb of Time. They walked towards the Midnight Forest, always forward, through Valbois, never looking back, following the unwavering star of Martis, until their path crossed with Genevieve, a celebrated culinary artist, skillfully blending animal blood into her dishes. In fact, she was a dampier, bearing a celestial mark chosen also by an astral, the moon. Because of the letter she had in her pocket, it was her destiny to intertwine with these three humans, to meet them in the establishment of the enigmatic Mr. Gourmet Fang. A snippet of conversation and two words caught Genevieve's attention. The Tomb of Time, which in Elvish could translate to Kronos Sanctum, the exact words from her letter. As the group was planning to go there, searching for the magic that could transpose the end of humankind, a plan was also forming in Genevieve's mind. Lucius, Hebdom and Gregory delighted themselves with the coltsunash and pastries filled with echalot and meat and enjoyed a cup of wine, while Genevieve packed abundant food for them and for herself as she decided to leave with them. As the four set to travel towards the Tomb of Time, a cosmic collaboration was being forged between three astral beings. Marthus, the handsome, rugged, and fiery red celestial with golden eyes. Mercurius, the orange-skinned, motherly emissary. And Lunai, the blue, shy overseer of the moon. Now, let's give these heroes some space to travel as an exciting ritual takes place among the beast folk. Shaklashak is of the snake folk. Surrounded by other Greenland beasts, he was highly aware of it. The others made it clear he wasn't welcome, only tolerated. If possible, Shaklashak wouldn't have chosen to take part, but it was required. The ritual, blessed by Obscuro, the All Hunter, was mandatory for anyone coming of age. It was the passage into adulthood. 
and Shaklashak wanted to get it over with. Do the trials. First, drink the concoction mixed with blood to give them strength. Then, finish the obstacle course. Hunt, find the prey, and bring it back. Return their hearts to the tribe. Survive and be greeted into the pack. Or the opposite. In this case, the game had the wild card. Catching the mongrel tied to the altar would earn extra favors from the gods and the tribe. Either way, he wanted everything to be over as soon as possible. He could no longer bear the disdainful look of the wolf and bear folk, even when they didn't stare at him. He felt like he was being watched, and his skin crawled at the thought. That was not far from the truth, as the ceremony was spied on from somewhere above, hidden in the greenery of the trees, by Kaith. She was Yarek's best friend, and Yarek, as you might or might not have guessed, was the half raven folk tied up for the ritual. Kaith shadowed him everywhere, even in captivity, even more so if there was something to gain. And she already had, but now she had to find a way to save her half-breed friend from Corvus clan. She couldn't bear to watch him lying on the beast folk's altar. Was he hurt? A soul tear escaped her eyelids and fell on the piece of paper she was clenching in her hand. It was a part of her most recent loot, an item of Mercurius. For a moment, swift, bright lines revealed a map. But even before she realized what had just happened, the map disappeared. She'd have to take a better look at the piece of paper sometime later, after saving Yarek, because the ritual had started as the beast folk roared. The swiftest seemed to be one of the snake folk, so she followed him since he had more chances to catch up with Yarek first. The trials, Kate realized, as she kept close to the snake folk youngling, aren't for the faint-hearted. The obstacle course, the waterfall, the underground river, the traps, and then the heart-thumping chase to get the prize. Yarek's heart. The half-breed Yarek ran, with Bodolf, the grey-furred wolf folk, biting at his heels, who, in turn, was hunted by Shaklashak. Not far behind, Kate desperately tried to catch up with them. But it so happens that our protagonist... You do remember them, don't you? Genevieve, Gregory, Lucius and Hebdom stumbled across the ritual and ended up clashing against Bodolf, who was chasing Yarek. Arrows, hammers and finally Shaq's venom sealed Bodolf's fate. Amidst the chaos, Lucius managed to mend Yarek's wounds with mud and saliva. But Gregory had fallen to his death, only to be revived by Hebdom, thanks to his connection to Marthus and Mercury. As footsteps were drawing near, they ran, forced to hide, just like half-breeds and humans have always been forced to, to survive. Maybe that was why this ragtag group, brought together by destiny, stayed together. Perhaps that was why Shaklashak, as the group would later discover after some bickering, intended to free Yarek all along. And that gave them hope, as they threaded through the midnight forest, away from immediate danger, into the unknown that lied before them. For how long did they walk? Neither of them could say, but they were far from the beast folk, entering a wondrous glade filled with bubbles simmering with light. With the tip of her finger, Genevieve touched one of them and it pulsated. Unbeknownst to them, something was triggered, and the stage, my dear audience, for the upcoming revelations and events, was set. Until next time. This was the recap for episode 1 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Ruxandra Vorotnev, your recap narrator. 
If you'd like to follow our Dungeons & Dragons campaign, Vim, The Tale of Immortality, tune in Sundays at 5 UTC on youtube.com slash New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us and remember, every subscribe keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampire bite!